Okay, welcome back everyone. We're going to start up again, um, continuing on the uh, model features session. Um, now we're going to um, get a presentation by, by Nick, and he's going to be talking about um, partitions, which is a very important component of developing the next generation model because it's sort of the underlying architecture. And if we get this wrong, we may not be able to add some features in the future. So um, looking forward to hear what Nick has to say. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to start off first by saying thank you to Mark and Simon for inviting me to speak on this topic. Um, I was asked to describe to you how the partitions for space tag populations, species, sex, and gender are dealt with in multi-fan CL. Um, I'm presenting this on behalf of the Oceanic Fisheries Program at SPC and just firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dave Fournier, John Hampton, Matt Vincent, Nicholas Duchamp Bath for helping me with putting this presentation together. Okay. That's not advancing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there are four sections to my talk. <clears throat> the main part deals with how these five partitions have been implemented in multi-fan CL. And then a brief outline of the development and testing methods we've used. And I'll close with some recommendations that might help discussion during this workshop. It's a really big topic. So I've done my best to condense it, but I sympathize it's after lunch and usually uh, a siesta is what one does there. So. Just bear with me. Um, so firstly, I think um, <clears throat> I see the, a lot of new faces here and uh, some people probably not familiar with multi fan CL, so a very brief history of it and a description. It's an integrated in that it integrates the fit over multiple data types. It's age structured in that the core population state is dimensioned in respect of age and length based because it's conditioned on length information and size compositions so, and also weight information, and the tag recapture data is, is structured in respect of length. It's particularly useful for tropical species where age-specific data is not very available. A brief history about multi-fan CL, it was first there was multi-fan, which was a gross des growth estimation package using cohort length frequencies. This framework was then integrated into an age structured model first applied to the South Pacific Albacore in 1993. And the complete multi fan CL model itself was first published in 1998, followed with an implementation in the Yellowfin stock assessment in the WCPO in 2001 by John Hampton, Dave Fournier, and John. S and then um, it followed, what followed then was some simulation testing by Mark LaBelle. And it's been used in the WCPO stock assessments consistently for the, for the last 20 years. The team consists of the primary developer being David Fournier. I provide some development support and um, implement testing of new features. The direction for the project is, is largely steered by John Hampton, Graham Pilling and Dave Fournier himself with support for software such as the viewer for looking at results by Fabrice Boyer. It's licensed jointly by the Oceanic Fisheries Program and um, Otter Research. It's written in C++ and it's a very big project. Uh, there, there are four dependent libraries. There's an in-house version of ADMB to which new data structures are added as the project develops and evolves. Open BLAST for, for large matrix routines such as singular value decompositions and versions. And QD for achieving the precision needed for some of the minimization procedures, and PVM3 <coughs> for 
undertaking some multi-threaded calculations of tags. It's generic with the dimensioning of the project op program operations performed by uh, input data and flag settings and input files. So to begin with, with the uh, space partition, for obvious reasons, including spatial partitioning is sometimes desirable. In terms of the biology, one may want to explicitly describe spatial processes that lead to heterogeneity within the stock. And in terms of fishing mortality, one aims to account for the heterogeneity in fleet structure or management measures, which are increasingly becoming more complex. So together one can explicitly describe the variable effects of fishing mortality on stock by area. And this, uh, in respect of the first bullet point, one can expect that there will be a lot of spatial heterogeneity for species such as the mo highly migratory tuna in the Pacific Ocean. This is a, an example of the complex spatial distribution of the various fisheries within the WCPO, in this case for yellowfin with the Indonesian and, and Philippine small-scale fisheries in yellow being primarily to the central and eastern parts, and the Persane, Pol uh, Persane fisheries in the central and western parts of the region. The nine regions shown here are those used for partitioning the models for yellowfin and big eye in the WCPO. The space partition is the region. And implicit within the population data structure, it is the first dimension in multifan CL, the N matrix or the bathtub that uh, was shown earlier on. So a region one might define as a subset within the stock unit, which the subpopulation within a time period is reasonably discrete from the other subsets. And there is movement processes among the regions. Now where the action really is in this partition is in respect of the parameterization for movement. So I'll go on and describe some of that. The movement must take account of the model's temporal and spatial configuration and what assumptions are being made for the process. Therefore, there has to be flexibility in terms of the temporal factor and the timing of movements and possibly the sharing of some of the movement coefficients among those time periods. And in terms of spatial, it needs the configuration for the number of regions and the regions that are adjacent. This is an example having nine regions, the typical Western, Western, Coast, uh, Western Central Pacific Ocean tuna models, with the arrows indicating adjacency among regions. Now from these adjacent movements, one derives an incidence matrix. Um, the entries for the adjacent regions in the matrix are one, and this matrix provides a pointer for assigning the estimated coefficients within the model. Complete flexibility is afforded in this parameterization so as to deal with odd spatial structures such as this one where one might have two separate regions only joined by corridors. And so one allows for all the possible configurations that one can have, but also the temporal assumptions. So with those coefficients among the adjacent regions, one can then calculate the matrices of the block transfer coefficients in a time period, V. So these are calculated in respect of the region of origin and the region of destination. Simply the numbers after, the numbers in a region R after movement is simply those minus those that move out plus those that move in from the other regions. The method used in multi-fan seal allows for a fully implicit solution being solved in reverse time. And what this allows is it allows for movement to occur to all regions within a given si uh, time step, even if they're non-adjacent. And this, um, this, allows for, um, this allows the model to be stable. Minimization stability is, is the key with the movement uh, parameterization. The option also exists to allow for age dependency in movement, and this can either be linearly or non-linear dependent. And in the case of uh, one of the models we have, with this, the Skipjack uh, tuna model, has had age-specific movement estimation in the past. So what's shown here is a representation of movement within a region 
and the region of origin of fish resident with that, within that region over time as the numbers of fish in that region equilibrate. So on the, on the x-axis you have time starting off, if you, if you look at the top example, the fish in yellow are those fish that originate from that region and through time some of those fish will move out and replaced by other fish from other regions. And in the lower one, it is the case for the red, the red band being those fish that begin in that region and then subsequently move out. So this gives you a, a, just a general impression of the kind of movement processes that can be estimated with this parameterization and multi-fan CL. Now moving to the tag partition, simply the tag partition runs in parallel to the untagged population and generally shares most of, this, of the same population dynamics. The tag structure is the same as the untagged, apart from the fact that the added dimension for the release event at the base level of that data structure. Therefore, in the code, the dynamic processes and parameterizations that apply to the tag population are implemented in exactly the same manner as the untagged population, except that the outer loop and all of the calculations are in respect of the release event dimension. Importantly, movement and growth of the tagged fish is identical to the untagged fish. The exception is recruitment, whereas uh, in, the, in the untagged population, recruitment is the recruitment of, of uh, juvenile fish coming into the population. Instead, you can consider the cohort of the, of the tagged population is that which occurs at the moment of the release event. There are a couple of steps which have to be taken in setting up the tag population, but within the general population model, firstly, the numbers that released at length must be transformed to the numbers at age. The underlying population model in multifan cell is age structured, and so there's the first, that's the first thing one needs to do is to convert them to numbers at age that are tagged. Also, there is a provision for a mixing period following the time of release to allow for the assumption that the tag population has mixed within the region of these. And for certain fisheries, one may choose to group the recaptures from the release event amongst uh, particular groups of fisheries. And this may help when the reported fishing method of recapture is not well or reliably known. For example, the Persane fisheries may choose to group all of the recaptures within that same, same collection of fisheries. Post-release in the mixing period, the tag population does not share the same fishing mortality processes as the untagged population. Rather, in the mixing period, the observed recaptures are removed from the tag partition by solving for the fishing mortality that achieves the observed tag recaptures. After the mixing period, then the fishing mortality of the tag population is the same as that of the general model. The tag population is separated into two components. Firstly, you have the tag cohort that's created at the time of the release event. Then after a user defined specified number of periods for, for the time at liberty, the tag group is placed into a single aggregate pooled tag group, wherein the age structure is maintained. Now this step in taking a certain number of your tag fish after a period of time at liberty and putting them into a single pooled group over all of the tag release groups is so as to optimize the calculation. Otherwise one will, may have senescent populations of tag fish running for an endless period of time, really slowing down the operation of the code. So just to demonstrate that with this schema, this shows the processes of your tag population coming in from Does that work? No? Okay. Uh, at the time of release, T rel on the top. At, does that work? There we are. Is that the mouse? Anyway, starting there in time uh, period five, you can see there's a group of uh, fish at age entering the tag population. And um, 
the two, they recruit at that time and then the total mortality is then applied in the subsequent tag periods and, and simply as an age matrix you can see the fish reducing in numbers as they uh, increase in, in uh, time of liberty and then applying at that time a pool that is the user specified time then th that age structure will then continue but not as part of the original tag population cohort. It will then go into this pool tag group and note that there will be no fish in any one tag population less than the number of periods of liberty specified before they enter the pooled group. And note that what I'm showing here is just the pooled group for that particular release event. All of the tag, individual tag release groups will then recruit into the pooled tag group. And the age structure within that group is maintained. The predictions from the tag partition must include the probability of being reported. That's at parameter X. So uh, the reporting rates in multifan seal can be not only fishery specific, but also specific to individual release groups. Because certain programs may have a, a better or a worse um, performance with regards to the reporting of voluntary tags. And as mentioned before, there is the option for grouping your your recaptures by particular groups of fisheries. In terms of the observed tag recaptures, these are recorded by the release group, the length at release, the recapture period, and the fishery of recapture. So as with the releases at length, the recaptures at length must be uh, calculated in respect of age using the length at release and the time at liberty. These are then assigned to the region of release and the region of recapture given the fishery of recapture, noting that all fisheries apply to a specific region. So let's briefly look at a real tuna example using the tag partition and multifan seal. Um, <clears throat> this is one which makes substantial use of the tag partition. And I take it from Matt Vincent's skipjack tuna assessment presented this year in August. This plot illustrates the released and recaptured skipjack from the three tagging programs conducted um, in the history of this, of this uh, fishery stock assessment. And what's shown here are just those recaptures uh, taken more than 1,000 nautical miles from the point of release. Um, they were conducted over a number of region and time periods. And uh, therefore, a particular release event or, or a tag population applies to a particular release and time period. And so therefore you have, in this case, uh, 269 release groups and therefore the model is running 269 individual tag populations. And there's an enormous amount of data on movement being made available to the model here with more than 56,000 recaptures. The x-axis is from the year 1980 to 2020. Uh, by the number of recaptures. And you can see that for the three large scale tagging studies, the model achieved a reasonable fit to the observed recaptures in any one time period. Now in respect of time at liberty, again, the model achieved an excellent fit over the uh, recaptures in respect to time at liberty. But just record, recalling that in the actual likelihood, the fit is with respect to the observed recaptures for a given uh, release group not in respect of times at liberty or, or the, the observed recaptures in general. The, the likelihood terms are specific to each release event. So the tagging data provided a great deal of information on movement and here are the estimated movement rates by quarter, quarter one, two, three and four. Um, for the regions of origin, those in the red numbers at the top, to the destination regions in green. So you can see that um, and what's shown is the magnitude of the movement in terms of a rate, the proportion of individuals moving from one region to another, with each column adding up to a total of one. So as expected, you might find that most of the recaptures or most of the movement uh, is, doesn't go beyond the region of origin, but there are in some quarters some substantial movements to the other regions. It's the kind of picture that you obtain um, from the tagging data. Okay, so moving now on to the petitions for species, stocks, and gender. Um, 
space and tag partitions were inherent in the original multi-fan sealed data structures. When the model was originally written, and recall that it's been around and being used for 20, 20 years now, so the partitions for species, stocks, and gender were only recently added, uh, with the development starting in about 2010. Now, why should one embark on such a large-scale uh, endeavor? Um, in respect of the parameter sharing, there are two benefits for having partitions for species, stocks, and gender. Um, in mixed fisheries, the fishing mortality parameters may be shared, and this overall will reduce the total number of parameters compared to undertaking assessment to independent assessments. You can gain benefits by combining them in a single model. And running independence uh, assessments independently offers no guarantee that the relative stock species uh, uh, ratios are actually realistic. Whereas if you can model the two, uh, these partitions together in the same model with using the aggregated catches, then the ratios among the partitions may be estimated. For example, of sharing the catchability for juvenile tuners in a, in a persane fishery might allow you to estimate those relative ratios. And in respect of uh, describing the biological processes, multi-stock and multi-sex models can be made more realistic. And finally, uh, where you have data where species stocks or, uh, have not been identified, that data may not have any utility. But if you have a, uh, a multi-species, multi-stock partition, then you can make use of those data. And I was just thinking in terms of data poor assessments, one may be able to use this aggregated information. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Okay, so here is a schema of how the partitioning was done on multi-fan CL. And we took this approach because we were modifying an existing set of software and a very large piece of software. So rather than globally going through the entire code and modifying all the data structures and parameterization, an adaptation of the region partition was made to facilitate the species partition. And I'll use the species as the example in this description. So in this schema, the simple case of just two regions and two species. So this is what I call the reality model. This is what a biologist would really like to do, is to have your two species within each of the two regions. Um, what one can do is can represent this reality by duplicating the regions and assigning one of the species to each. And this is what we call the region partition. So in these two regions, you have species one, you duplicate those regions, and you have region three and four for species two. And the dynamics for each species are performed in the respective region as if they were operating in the same region. For example, the movement occurring between the regions, but with the movement parameters being specific to each species. Using this approach, similarly, the fisheries in the reality model are replicated in the additional regions, such that these fisheries are what we call mirrored fisheries. So the core fisheries data, such as fishing incidents and importantly effort, are duplicated in the mirrored fisheries, but the catch and size composition data can be disaggregated or aggregated among the two species. Now this approach entailed creating a new multi-species class what we call here PMSD, with all its uh, member objects relating to the species greater than one. So effectively, we are duplicating or cr creating additional class members for, for the additional species. Now, in all relevant in incidences in the code, where con it required conditions being made in respect of that class being allocated, that is, now the, the code knows that this is a multi-species model and the assigned members are then accessed. So in this example here, this is where the recruitment parameters for species greater than, greater than one are accessed and are sent to the minimizer through this routine here. So all of these recruitment, this is the class now holding the recruitment parameters for species IEC. And where operations are performed in respective regions, the class member pointer, in this case, region bounds, indicates over which regions these operations are be, to be performed so that you can identify for which species these uh, operations relate to. 
Now, needless to say, this added a lot of complexity to the code. To be entirely generic, it was necessary to allow for every possible combination of the data being either aggregated or disaggregated with respect to species in any particular fishing incident. And this was achieved by adding flags to each record of the fisheries data, indicating its status as being aggregated or disaggregated for any combination of the fisheries data, catch, length frequency, and weight frequency for that particular incident. In the aggregated case, uh, for size composition, the predicted proportions in each species are scaled according to the species ratio estimated uh, in the predicted catches before being aggregated in the likelihood. Now the tag partition also needed to take account of the species partition. Uh, because the data structures in the tag partition were already dimensioned by region, the region adaptation gave us a ready uh, method for accommodating the multi-species tagging events. So allow for aggregated and disaggregated tagging events, the data for each release event was indexed by species flags to denote to which species it related to. Disaggregated events are quite simple, they're assigned to the respective regions of that species in that region adaptation. Whereas aggregated events, we needed to replicate that particular tagging data for the species greater than one that is in the mirrored uh, regions for that species and apportioning the tags according to the predicted population ratios in the model. The predicted recaptures are then subsequently aggregated before being fitted into the, uh, in the likelihood to the observed aggregated recaptures. So that's the case for the multi-species. Now to extend this to multiple stocks and sexes, the region adaptation was readily generic, such that the mirrored regions were provided appropriate data structures for us to, to uh, uh, model the partitions for any of the three species, stocks or sexes. Stocks and sexes can be regarded as a special case of species, but with some of the biological and fishery processes being shared to a lesser or a greater degree. To implement the different processes, this is managed by alternative parameterizations and with certain parameters being either shared among the, the stocks or, or, or sexes or not. So here are some of the key differences in how the region adaptation is applied to stocks and sex partitions compared to that of the species partition. Essentially, it relates to an increased level of sharing. So here are some of the, the uh, parameter configurations that one might, might be working with. And for the stocks and the sexes, you have more sharing of, of those parameters. Um, in the case of the sex partition, recruitment estimation is obviously shared among the sexes. And the bivalent halt stock recruitment relationship is only estimated in respect of the female spawning biomass only. Only shown here are some of the differences that were applied in, in the examples that we've investigated so far. But the degree of sharing will obviously be very case specific and when, you, when you're coding this one needs to allow for any possible uh, situation that a user may require and also whether the data is, is aggregated or disaggregated. For example, uh, if the data are disaggregated in respect of um, sex, then you would not want to be using a shared selectivity at length. And then of course, you've got the other biological parameters, which uh, would most likely be partition specific in most of all cases. So this schema shows the simple process of parameter transfer during the uh, minimization procedure in multi-fan CL. So <clears throat> this is how we get around the, the issue of sharing parameters. The actual parameters assigned within the population model theta are organized into a single vector, the X vector, that is then sent to the minimizer. And with each iteration, the X vector is supplied to the minimizer, which returns the, the vector back with new values. And these are then transferred back to the model to be assigned to the theta parameters in the dynamic population model for the next evaluation. So this interface here performs the, uh, the routines and uh, perform the function that allows for the parameter sharing 
including vector or matrix parameter structures. So this is a, uh, a, a bit of a diagram here, which um, shows how the grouping uh, a vector from one to n groups is created. So each unique fishery that belongs to a group is identified by the group number. You'll have a collection of fisheries in that group. And this approach has been long used for uh, single species models in multi-fan cell. The principle for sharing is then extended to species greater than, greater than one by including the mirrored fisheries. So again, the, the region adaptation and, and replication of fisheries for the additional species lent itself readily to the existing structure in multi-fan CL for allowing for the sharing of parameters. And in, in principle, one should be able to then uh, continue this for n number of species or combinations of the partitions. I think it, it's uh, useful to mention here, and I, I was heartened by some of the, the comments made in the earlier presentations, a, a brief mention regarding the development and testing of the code for the partitioning. This was a substantial development in the code, take over, over some years, and rigorous testing was needed to identify breakages to the single species operation. So a testing framework was built using simplified data set based on uh, two single species models, the elephant and big eye. And the single species version of the multifancial code was retained prior to the developments and tested using these data sets. And so that pairwise comparisons could be made at regular points during the development to ensure the code integrity of the new code being developed. And these tests included deterministic model evaluations with, with fixed set of parameters and full model fits using the single species and the multi-species examples. And also what was applied with the routine benchmark tests, which I'll explain a bit later on in the presentation. So this schema shows the multi-species testing framework, how the pairwise comparisons were made between the single species and multi-species solutions using, the, um, using the, the fit of the single species examples with the before and after um, uh, versions of the code. Then the combined data uh, for both species was, was then fit using the after version of the code, that is the version including the, the partitioning and pairwise comparisons amongst the, the, the results for the respective species were made to see if we were getting the same answers essentially. And note that for this testing, all of the fisheries data was disaggregated with respect to species. So the test was specifically to check for the integrity of the model calculations for each species discreetly, but using the multi-species partitioning feature. So for doing these tests, a, um, <clears throat> a set of cut down data sets were created from the big eye and elephant models, having some complexity, uh, but with a reduced model time period. So what we wanted to achieve was uh, rapid computation with the testing, but yet retaining the full extent of the parameterizations being used in the large complex tuna assessment models. And note that uh, to date, no production multi-species stock assessment using Molifanciol has yet been completed. So what I present are the testing results being a demonstration of the implementation of the multi-species partition. So here we have firstly, just to say that um, the deterministic part of the testing using fixed parameters being input to the model produced identical results with the before and after, which is what we were seeking. And shown here are the pairwise comparisons of the fitted solutions. So running the single species models to, to convergence and then running the same data with the multi-species partitioning to convergence. And this just shows that there were negligible differences in terms of biomass, growth estimates, the Bevan and Holt stock recruitment relationships and the estimated equilibrium yields. So this essentially just um, confirmed that the code operations were replicated equally when being applied with the multi-species partitioning. Now for the stock partition, we look at an example of it being implemented. Now I'll just say here that there's a big caveat placed upon the results presented here. Uh, it's put simply a proof of concept that's a work in progress at the moment. 
and uh, it uses a large data set available for the Big Eye Tuna in the WCPO and the EPO and uh, it's taken from the 2015 Pacific Wide model which some of you may have seen at Cape Him, uh, um, a couple of years back and it has a large quantity of size composition and tagging data in it. Um, the simple stock models were used in this demonstration were a great simplification for the initial exploration of the multi-stock implementation. So this shows the simplification made <clears throat> for the multi-stock example, reducing from the 12 regions. So here's the, the nine regions of the WCPO and three regions of the EPO. And uh, we, we reduced that down to just two regions with uh, two stocks. And so each stock had its recruitment originating in only one region. And um, of the 40 fisheries, the data was assumed to be aggregated for six of those fisheries in region one and four of the fisheries in region two. That is, the, the data was, the, the catch data was mixed amongst the, the two stocks uh, for in those six fisheries and four fisheries in region two. And the main data <clears throat> used in fitting these models is the Japanese CPUE indices and a total of around 70 release tagging events, most of which were from the region one. So the parameterization that uh, differed from the multi-species case uh, for this particular multi-stock example, uh, in terms of biology, the recruitment of each stock is now region specific. For the multi-species case, one would have the region potentially occurring among all regions. Um, so the, re the recruitment originates in one of the regions and then uh, thereafter with movement, the populations then comprise a mixture of the two stocks in each region. With regards to the fisheries, the selectivity at length and catchability could be shared in the fisheries having aggregated data. So note that all the fisheries impact upon both stocks within a region and stock fishing mortalities are being estimated for these fisheries that comprise a mixture of the two stocks. So here are some of the prototype model estimates. In terms of the stock specific recruitments, the, the estimates were substantially higher for the, uh, st the stock number one. And you can see that they had different trends. So you were actually getting some, some real differences in the uh, estimated recruitments. And uh, in terms of the stock biomass, you can see that uh, uh, for stock two, it occurs mostly in region two. So there's very little movement out of, out of the uh, region two, but whereas for uh, region two, it comprises something of a mixture of the two stocks. In terms of the growth estimates for stock two, these were somewhat lower than for stock one with substantially higher individual variation. But note that this is just a prototype model. And while we were able to demonstrate here that the stock specific growth estimates were being estimated and you're getting some difference between the two stocks, the actual results that you see here are not consistent with our current understanding. Um, currently, the, uh, <coughs> this model is only being fit to length frequency data. There is no direct observations such as age length data being used in the fit. So it's not surprising that it's having some difficulty in fitting it. And plus we've also simplified the structure of the model a great deal. So at this stage of the exploration, it might be a good idea to rather fix the growth, eth growth estimates being used in the, in, the, in the model. So here are some examples of the uh, shared selectivity estimates for just for two of the 40 fisheries. Um, and you can see the effect of the stock specific growth on the shared selectivity at length amongst the two stocks and the lower growth, lower L infinity for stock two resulting in the selectivity terminating at a certain point. And that's reflected in the differences in the selectivity at age being estimated for the two stocks. Now, moving on to the multi-sex partition. To account for the sex, uh, there are some clear benefits from modeling the gender partition to describe sex specific processes such as dimorphism, natural mortality and maturity. So by sharing the parameters such as selectivity and, and catchability and fishing mortality, you can estimate or attempt to estimate some of the spatial heterogeneity in the population by sex 
and age. So some examples of these characteristics we can see in the in WCPO tuners where uh, sex ratios may be different with respect to fish size. And in the case of swordfish, the difference between the dotted lines are the growth for the males and females. So there are some benefits in being able to incorporate these explicitly in the model with, with using the sex partition. So as with the stock partition, gender can be regarded as a special case of the species partition and implemented using this region adaptation. The differences with respect to the uh, species in stocks cases is that you have the, uh, clearly there's the sharing of, of the recruitments and the bivalent halt stock recruitment relationship is only using the spawning biomass of the females and that there is a likely to be an increased fishery related parameter sharing, um, for example, the length based selectivity. But no, this is only for the uh, fisheries where the catch data is aggregated amongst the sexes. Now, just as a quick aside, one thing we did encounter with um, <clears throat> developing this was that uh, when there is no disaggregated data with respect to sex, it becomes uh, difficult to estimate sex ratios. So a provision was therefore made for sharing certain of the fishing, fishing mortality parameters among the sexes. And the effort deviates in multi-fan CL are one of the multiplicative components of the, um, of the overall fishing mortality. Now recall that the fisheries are mirrored in respect of uh, sexes one and two. So um, each sex has its own respective set of fishing mortalities. And when only aggregated data is available, um, there's no observation regarding the sex ratio and the catch. So one might assume that average catchability would be shared amongst the sexes. And in this case, you get minimization stability. Basically, there's uh, infinite possible solutions. And you can get implausible e estimates for the, uh, for the effort deeds because of compensating for that shared average catchability and the deviates can become very strongly positive or negative. But this can be uh, stabilized if you assume also that the effort deviates are shared. Now, for um, developing and testing the implementation of this expedition, basically we followed the same approach as we did for the multi-species, but in this different case, we tried to highlight the errors uh, between the use of these, these partitions. And so we made the two species that we that were assumed to be as sexes uh, absolutely identical so that this would highlight any coding errors and problems. And the test criterion in this particular instance was whether the Bevan and Holt stock recruitment relationship and the equilibrium yield calculations uh, for the multi-sex case would be an exact sum of that obtained for the two identical species. And uh, essentially the tests uh, proved positive after quite a long time of debugging and improving. <laughs> um, so aside from the proxy example uh, used for te testing the multi-sex feature, Yukio Takeuchi and Nicholas Duchamp Bath have produced models, uh, multi-sex models for swordfish and striped marlin. And I'll use the swordfish uh, example as a demonstration for implementing it in, in this presentation. So what uh, Yukio did was to uh, fix the, uh, the, the parameters for uh, sex specific growth and natural mortality. In this case, the females being the red line in growth and being the green line in terms of natural mortality. Uh, and when you ran the model, this yellow line here is the multi-sex example and it produced estimates of equilibrium yield that were comparable to the model uh, when it was just modeled as a, as a single sex. In terms of the uh, <clears throat> other results, uh, he, he looked at uh, three models. The, um, the blue line is the single sex model. The yellow line is the multi-sex model, but assuming the same parameters as the single sex model for both sexes. And so that test was really to see that you were generally getting a very similar result to the single sex model. And the red line is the multi-sex model. So it was producing comparable, comparable results. And here again are the selectivities at length. And for the males in blue, 
one can see again the effect of the lower L infinity and the slower growth for the, for the males. So now to summarize uh, for the species stock six partitions, the multifan seal, the partitioning for these uh, three uh, elements, uh, st structures in the model was not achieved by using ex explicit data structures. We used this region adaptation because it was convenient at the times and it was consistent with the existing fishing, fishery and tagging structures in the code. And the, while the coding is tested positive, um, at this stage, the multi-partitioning feature hasn't been applied for a production stock assessment, but uh, in doing it for the swordfish, uh, Yukio did conclude that the sex partition was successfully implemented for that, uh, for that assessment. Just a couple of points regarding the limitations of the testing. Um, at this stage, we've only used two or three of the partitions in a single model. It had uh, two partitions in a single model, but more than that haven't been implemented um, in, in combination. So for example, multi-species with multi-sex or multi-stock with multi-sex. At this stage, we've only ever used one of those three possible partitioning. And no more than two species or stocks or sexes have been used in the, in the, single, in the single example. For example, we haven't explored three or four stocks in a single model. And um, you would have noticed that I didn't mention anywhere in the parameterization any uh, facility for interaction processes amongst the uh, species, stocks, and sexes. So that can be something which um, can be developed in the future. So as part of this talk, I was also asked to outline how we did things in MultiFanCL uh, in regards to the development of the code. And I think it might be useful for discussions to have a brief overview of the testing framework used in multi cell so that uh, <clears throat> we, we ensure that develop, code developments don't introduce new bugs. And some of these ideas might be of help if embarking on a large scale software development for a large and complex generic model in the future. The framework we use in multi cell has two stages. Obviously, when you have a new feature, the first stage is to run a, a really intensive laboratory using a specific set of examples to fully explore that new feature, report on it and test that it's actually doing what was anticipated. And secondly, what I term as benchmark testing, which I, which I mentioned earlier on. And these are proofing the new code versus the existing release version. And this testing basically uses a large array of testing data, single species, multi-species, deterministic projections, stochastic projections, and you run both the versions through all of those data sets. Note that because the, uh, the distinction among species, stocks, and sex partitions is due largely to parameterization differences, it's important to test the developments using example representative of all these partitions. It's essential to detect any coding that may have broken the single or the multi-species calculations. And I really stress the importance of undertaking these tests because they're often where bugs arise or bugs reveal themselves. <coughs> so um, here's a schema of the testing framework and the two, the, the, some key points here. The first one is regarding the repository. So here we have the two branches and we always keep those two discrete and set apart from the points where you take a copy or you merge them. Um, and on the left hand side, what happens is you take the develop the copy of the branch, add the new features, and this is essentially the testing framework here. Uh, so, and once the tests are positive, only then do you actually take the development branch and merge the master branch to the development branch. So in this manner, all stages of the development are traceable and the code integrity can be maintained. And if you, if you find a, an error in the future, you can go back to that point in the development branch and isolate what coding change was made there. Oh, and by the way, I didn't, I might have mentioned it earlier, all of the repository is in GitHub. Um, <clears throat> so what usually happens is that we get a proof of concept of a new feature and idea, and normally that's developed in an ADMB project, which is a separate simulation exercise. Once that's taken as being correct, well then we will code that into multi in a separate set of routines that are fully discrete 
operated in respect of uh, flags and um, usually tried to keep separate from all the other existing parts of the code. So in this way, we try not to break either the single species or the multi-species operations. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is, is finish with uh, four recommendations. And I think at this stage, it's useful to ask the question, well, what would we do differently if we were starting to code multi cell from scratch today? In other words, with the benefit of hindsight, what are the lessons that we, we learned? And I know an expert who would say that uh, establish the correct data structures to begin with, and the code will write itself. Well, that may be the case for some people, but anyway, uh, while the region adaptation worked in this case, it's not optimal. And actually it raised a lot of complexity. While at the time rebuilding the entire project with new data structures seemed like a big job, it was probably the right thing that we could have done. So this is a data structure that I'm just putting up for uh, an offering for discussion. But uh, note that um, what you would potentially cater for in a data structure would be to have all possible partition options that you might like to have in a population model. And note that the last two dimensions could be a matrix in respect of age and length. Now, this is just a, a suggestion, I think, to um, s s consider what sort of dimensioning or what kind of um, partitioning would be possible in a, in a new uh, generic model. But in the simplest case, um, a lot of those dimensions would reduce to one and you would return to the simple region, time period, age structured population model. Um, in developing something like this structure, uh, one would need to uh, undertake careful coding so as to avoid inefficiencies in the memory management, most likely caused by having these huge multidimensional arrays. But it's recommended that the concept of this potential level of partitioning be, uh, be considered. And in, the, uh, in that recommendation, I also included the partitions for growth morphs and length structure. But in respect of, um, in respect of length, um, it, this enables one to explicitly model spatial heterogeneity and growth rates. And this is most suitable because growth generally can be considered as a length-based process. And following the movement of fish among regions, the effect of region-specific growth rates can be correctly modeled by applying the growth of the ambient region into which the fish is moved in respect of that fish's length. And so therefore the temporal continuity of the growth history of the fish is maintained and is consistent with the movements among regions throughout its lifetime. So I think a length structure would be a very useful um, feature to have. There are two often uh, used reasons for why one might increase model complexity. And um, as biologists, we quite often want to include as much biological reality in the model as possible, to describe the real processes for movement, growth, subpopulations, um, and that can produce a lot of complexity. The other region, sorry, reason is that uh, fishery and management specifications are becoming increasingly complicated and the, the demands for advice on a finer and finer spatial scale come through. And so then models can become really complicated and it in, in inevitably in, increases the model's computational requirements. Now, some of this can be offset by sharing parameters amongst partitions, but in our experience, the more partitions result in large, slow models. And ultimately, this can be managed by multi-threading model calculations. And this was attempted in multi fan cell in respect of the tag partition where we were able to uh, multi-thread some of the calculations and it produced uh, moderate Im improvements in performance, but nothing that would uh, be uh, a universal change to the speed at which multi fan CL runs these very large models. So the recommendation is that multi-threading be an attribute of any generic modeling software, such as available in TMB for the user-defined dynamic model and also for the random effects models. And this is probably stating the obvious, but it's something learned from our experience in developing the code, is to have a good representative example of what it is that you're trying to work with. So working with a, with a good actual example 
from which you can employ all the various features or additional partitions that you're trying to create, and then undertaking pairwise comparisons with what you had that generated that example. So in this regard, existing generic software with multi-partitioning, such as multi-fan seal, would have value as simulators to produce complex examples that could feed into some large-scale development process. Um, and uh, could characterize the multiple partitions. And using the simulation feature in multi-fan CL, you could generate either deterministic or stochastic examples that you could then run in simulations to test your new software against the original. So that, that's about it. Sorry I ran a little bit over. <laughs> Um, any questions? Yeah, Rick. That was great, Nick, to get that in-depth view. Thank I really you. appreciate it. At the end, you were presenting your, um, the link structure, and it seemed that you're essentially treating it almost as an individual model by tracking the mean size of animals as they move into an area and then as a time sequence moving back out. Is that correct? So that the time varying, <laughs> that growth is area specific and it's applied to a cohort of animals as they move in and then potentially move out and back again. Um, yeah, the, uh, essentially what we've just described there is some conceptual idea of, of how we might want to try to achieve something there. Actually, how to do it within the code, I don't think we've specifically thought about that, except for the fact that we, one would apply length-based growth. So you would be moving fish of particular lengths into among the, among the regions and then applying the length-based growth that's specific to that particular region. So it wouldn't be individual-based in the sense that each fish would be tracked in this, but, but the length-based the length growth applied to a fish coming from a fast-growing region to a slow-growing region would be specific to its length at, after it's moved into that region. So that's kind of how I was thinking of it. That's correct. Okay. Yes. So, so that, the, yeah. So it'd be a, a mixture. What would arise would be a mixture. But you may conceivably have a fish that would undergo a range of different growth uh, regimes during its lifetime, depending upon its movement amongst the regions. Is that? Kind of how I've got it. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I mean, that sounds really complicated. Um, I guess I was looking at some of the fits that when you move between models and you said they looked very similar. It, have you thought <coughs> about how similar is similar and when identical should be happening? Uh, I, was, I wasn't able to keep track of what you were changing all the time, but it seemed there were some cases where it looked like the model should be identical and they weren't absolutely identical. And does that imply there's a convergence problem or confounding problem or uh, I shouldn't bother? That's a good question, Andre. Um, the, uh, the testing, I think, is, is there is some discretion when you're comparing the results of uh, two versions of the code in respect of their converged solutions. I think the real key test, which we always undertake, are uh, deterministic comparisons to begin with. So feeding the exact same set of parameters into each of the two versions produces identical answers. Now, when the, the, uh, the, converged, the tests of two converged solutions can differ a little bit. And... Um, the differences that you saw there were, were negligible, but they were visible. And there were certainly some differences in the, in the recruitment estimates. And that's because they were cut down solutions with very little signal in the CPUE. So the fact that they came anywhere near close to each other was quite, quite, uh, quite good. But they did arrive at um, slightly different converged solutions. I mean, the likelihoods would have been extremely similar, but um, I guess what you're trying to look at there is, are you testing for structural changes to the model or are you exploring minimization differences or convergence issues in the model? Now that part of the code was never touched. So essentially what I think you're seeing there is a difference in the, 
the minimization path being taken during the convergence process um, that results in a slightly different answer. Yeah. I mean, these are but doesn't that make you feel a little uncomfortable that there's not a solution out there somewhere else that you haven't found? Certainly. I mean, if you, if you want to look for, um, for a global minimum, if you're doing a stock assessment, then I would be really concerned. But testing the, uh, testing the integrity of a, of a set of code calculations, I think it's... John. Yeah, one thing I did notice looking at the presentation, Nick, was for the multi, for the two species example, which may be what Andre is referring to. Yeah. Um, you use 28 quarterly age classes for both species, but the single species models, it's yellowfin 28 and big eye 40. That's correct. So, is there a is there a constraint in the in the two species application that they have to have the same number of age classes? No, no. So that's recently been changed that you can have a unique maximum age for two species within the same multi-species model. So that, that capability is there. But when you're making the pairwise comparison, you're always comparing apples with apples. So the single species example used the lower number of maximum ages for the big eye. Yep. Okay, Nick, um, I got a question, possibly for you, possibly for someone else, to, in the castle, at least the castle guys, but um, you, in your actual application, you used um, the region as a general partition. But in your um, suggestion, you suggested that you should implement all the partitions that you think might be useful in the future into the code. So I wonder why you think that's better um, and also, if anyone in the audience knows anything about Castle 2, whether the Castle 2 general partition is similar to your region partition and why they think doing it that way is better than implementing each partition separately. Uh, I'll just try and answer that. We'll give my opinion on that one first. Is that the um, ideally one would like to have the data structures as the the, the explicitly expressing each partition. That just makes the code, coding so much clearer and less complicated. And I noticed in one of the earlier talks there, having a lot of if blocks in your code will tend to slow it down. So you're not going to have to constantly be looking to see if some class member is allocated before you perform an operation. So um, I, I think the, the advice, anyway, from, from Dave in any case is to have your data structures re representing all of the partitioning that you want to incorporate. Now, I, I'd be quite interested to learn a little more about how the partitioning is done in Casal, because if, if they are capable of having flexibility in how many partitions or what you assign to all of the partitions and how they do that in the code, I think would be a very valuable part of uh, understanding a better way forward for developing something. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah, I could probably just make a few comments on Cassell, but m maybe, uh, maybe also I could talk about it on Thursday when I give my talk. But um, basically, uh, Castle One had like kind of a hierarchical partition structure. Um, you know, it had like uh, six embedded within region um, and array array styles, and we've moved away and more towards, um, I guess, uh, like hash tables, where the con there's a, each element of the partition has an age structure, um, and we just do a lookup on a table to access that. And so, and basically that gets away from a lot of these constraints about, um, you know, creating these multi-dimensional arrays and you just make it completely user-defined and just do a lookup. I mean, that's kind of how we've gone about that. How often in Castle do you have null partitions? Because that's where that really makes a difference. When you've got like re stock four can't go into region three yeah. and you're carrying essentially a whole bunch of zeros which hopefully you don't use, but it's still a waste of resources. Um, whereas if using a list of point, a pointed list, it, it's just, it's just cleaner. You don't need anything you don't use. 
And also you don't have to change your indices if you change all your, if you add another dimension to your partition, you yeah. don't have to change every bloody array that you've created. You just yeah. add another mod of, um, hashtag. Yeah, and the other one is the, um, you, like there's a lot of conditions you put in there with aggregated or disaggregated with data. Um, and so if you come up with kind of a, a way that you can just say uh, this observation is this category plus this category, um, then you don't have to build all these test cases about aggregation and disaggregation. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to answer Andre's point, most of the time you carry around null partitions as tagging. Tagging can be a bit of a, because you each kind of tag release is, a, is another partition member. Um, and so, one way, which I, in theory is in there, but I don't know if it's been tested, is you basically just delete those partitions after certain liberty, kind of like your set to get rid of that memory. So is it just like you iterate over what you have? Your castle. Yeah, well, um, most things that want to access the partition have like a key. Mm -hmm. So they just ask the petition, you know, give me numbers at age for this key. And we have like a petition class which returns numbers at age. That's efficient. Okay, thanks a lot.